I'm always impressed when artists can capture the character of a scene. And that's what I strive to do when I paint. So today I'm gonna to walk you through my process in really trying to capture the character of this winter neighborhood scene. So one of the first things that I do when I select a scene is I think about what drew me to the scene in the first place. What am I excited about here? What do I wanna emphasize in this scene? I mean, I liked a few things. I liked these long shadows. I liked the sunlight catching the side of this house. The sun is lower in the sky at this point in the day. It's casting these long shadows. It's a more direct light, less diffused light. So it's helpful to think through these things first. These indicators will help you determine how to approach the scene and how to paint the scene. I wanna keep that light in mind as I paint the whole rest of my painting. And a big part of making this light believable is painting correct values. And when we talk about values, we're talking about how light or how dark a value is and how they compare and relate to each other. So a helpful way to start seeing this a little more clearly is to turn your reference photo black and white. Once we remove some of that color information, we can start to see our values a little bit more clearly. Let's move into the drawing phase of our painting. When I draw my scene, I'm already starting to think about connections. I'm looking for the larger shapes of the scene. So this vehicle connects right into the bushes, which connect right into the house. That creates this nice connection that your eye can go from one shape to the other. And then that line of the street connects on the other side of the painting. And that's where the houses are in the background. And then, so once I've established the large shapes, then I can put in some details like the windows the little separated areas. And this is interesting because this is kind of how I tend to paint as well. I wanna paint the large connected shapes first, and then I go back in and paint the details that make the scene believable, and the little bits that create separation between the bigger shapes. And that is my drawing for the scene, pretty straightforward. And now let's move into the first wash of the painting. So one thing you'll see me do here is I'm wetting down both sides of my paper. And I get a lot of questions about this. I like to do this because this is one way that I've learned how to paint. And when you wet down both sides of the paper, you're giving yourself more time to paint wet and wet, which is one of the most amazing, beautiful parts of this medium. And so I like taking advantage of that. Now, if you wet down one side of your paper, it's gonna buckle and fold up and be a little harder to paint on. So if you wet down both sides of the paper, it will stick to your surface and actually it will dry flat as well. And it gives you more time to work wet and wet. Right away from this first wash, I'm thinking about what attracted me to the scene. And I've, I keep talking about the light on this house. That's the punchline of this painting. That's the main story here in this scene. And so that's the bit of character that this scene has that I wanna emphasize as I move forward. So that's gonna dictate how I paint the scene even starting in this first wash. And so I wanna leave that as the lightest area of the scene. And so as I'm painting wet into wet, I'm moving around my scene, I'm finding those other colors other local colors of objects and letting these colors just kind of blend together on the paper. Now, timing in the scene is kind of important because I want to capture these soft shadows on the side of this house. And in order to do this, I need to paint those shadows while it's still wet. I'm gonna paint right onto the side of this house while the paper is still pretty damp because I want these shadows to be strong enough, but I still want them to have a soft edge as well. Okay, and the next thing I'm doing, I'm taking some more of this cool color here. I'm using some Payne's Gray for this color and some lavender and some cobalt blue as well. And while this foreground is still pretty wet, I'm laying in a large soft shadow. And the temptation here is to paint things a little too weak. It takes a little bit of getting used to when you're painting wet and wet, because what tends to happen is there's a lot of water on my paper. There's a lot of water in this larger brush. And so what happens is the strength of this is going to fade as my paper dries. So I need to compensate for that a little bit. I need to paint just a touch darker than I think that I need to. So my values will be more accurate. 
and finally some more saturation, a little brighter, warmer color for the brick that's on this house. All right, well at this point, I'm gonna let my paper dry completely and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna paint the sky on top of what we've already painted and then add some more darks and details to bring our scene together. So my sponsor for this video today is me. And you may have heard me talk about my watercolor community. So how this works is members that join my watercolor community, they get access to a new step-by-step -step tutorial every month. These videos, I go in depth in my process of creating the painting from the very beginning throughout the end. And you get to see me paint this painting in real time. So each month you have a brand new tutorial along with all the other videos that I've created up to this point. So if you feel like you're stuck, if you just wanna get feedback on your painting, you could submit it to me and I create a video critique of members' work to give them feedback and help them know what areas they can be working on and improving on to continue growing. Sri says, you have the knack for unraveling complex process and explaining it in simple terms to someone who is just starting out. And Steven says, I can't thank you enough for that critique. This will help me so much going forward. Jen says, I absolutely love painting the sky now, thanks to you. And Matt says, the best tutorials that I've found online. So there's no risk to you with this. If it's not a good fit, you can cancel at any time. If you're ready to take the next step forward in your painting journey, click on the link below to get to Watercolor Community. And I really hope that I see you there. All right, back to the tutorial. At this point, my painting has completely dried and I'm ready to move in to painting the sky. I'm attempting to show this midday winter scene and I need it to appear as if the sun is really bright. And in order to do that, I need to make sure that my sky is dark enough to make the other light areas of my painting stand out. So this takes some practice, learning how to mix values dark enough. And here I'm using a lot of my cooler colors, some cerulean, some lavender, some cobalt blue, and a little bit of cobalt teal blue as well. So you wanna take your time and make sure that you have the right consistency in this paint. You really want this sky to be dark enough. All right, I'm working my way down the paper and I'm cutting around the top of my house and as I get closer to the horizon, I'm using a little bit more water and a little bit more cerulean. Now this is an exciting part of the painting. I'm going to drop in these distant trees wet into wet and create some really soft edges in this part of the painting. So for this color, I'm using some raw umber, some burnt sienna, and some Payne's gray to create a dark earth tone for these trees in the background. So I've dropped them in. I'm gonna go ahead and add some more value and some darkness as I work my way towards the horizon. And now it's very complicated to look at the background of this scene and get really stuck on some of the complicated houses and other shapes back here. And really I just wanna abstract everything. I want a few little bits of light, but I'm really thinking about the larger shape of the trees and the shadows things of similar value that I'm able to connect back there. Because the story of this painting isn't about these houses in the background, it's about the bright light on the front of our main house here. And so I switched to some cooler colors and I let the coolness run together with some of these warmer earth tones to create one large shape in the background. And while things are still damp, I can throw some darks in and create this soft transition to some darker values. And also, I'm connecting the darker parts of this car right into the background. So I'm using this wet edge and connecting this to the background as well. I'm gonna move right into this bush, the darker parts of the bush underneath the snow-covered areas. And then that is gonna connect in to some of my darker shadows as well. So I'm trying to create one big shape as I paint this. And as the sky starts to dry up a little bit, I'm gonna move into more of a dry brush mark. 
I want to use a little bit more texture of the paper as this it's going to bring this tree forward and push the other trees further into the background. And something that I found helpful when painting dry brush, load up your brush to what you think is the right consistency, but don't be afraid to try it out on some scrap paper before you paint it on your painting. It's hard to get these little bits of timing just right, and there's no rule that says you can't practice before you make a mark on your painting. So take your time, make sure you're making the right mark that you want to make before you paint it. And so I'm just kind of using the side of my brush, creating some texture to bring some of those trees forward. Let the softer edge trees kind of push into the background. And now I'm to the stage of my painting where I'm going to start to paint some darks. We can't have that light show up until we have darks in our scene. And so now I'm, I'm gonna go in and carefully add some darks and start to define a few things in this scene as well. So adding some darks around this car really help bring the car forward and it helps push the, the background into the background even more. And I need a little bit of darks back there to kind of make some separations and just bring enough detail into the background to make it read correctly. I like to take a palette knife when things are almost dry and scrape in a few highlights, a few branches, just a little more detail in some of these areas. So I need some more detailed branches on some of these closer trees. And for this, I'm using a rigger brush and I'm mixing up some thicker paint on a rigger brush and I'm gonna add in some more branches. So once we get these details in, these little bit of bits of dark, our scene is starting to come together. It's bringing this area forward and again, it's pushing other areas further back. And now I'm adding a little bit more detail on our house. You know, there's some lines where the trim is on the house and I'm leaving some of those lines out on the brightest section of the house here where, where I really want the light to shine. And that helps add to the effect of bright light shining off of the side of this house. And a couple more finishing touches. I'm adding a little bit more warmth and color on these bricks on this part of the house as well. And notice as I move away from this focal area where the bricks are more in shade, I'm using a cooler red. So I'm using some lavender and some cobalt blue to cool this red down as I move away from that area. And finally, I'm adding some details onto the house. I'm darkening up some areas on uh, some windows there. Just a few more finishing touches, some small marks in the trees, some small details. And that is it. That is about all I'm gonna need for this scene. And before you go, I wanted to mention, if you haven't checked out my free video lesson, How to Avoid Overworking Your Painting, take a look at it. You can follow the link below. You can get to it in my bio and Instagram. So I've gotten some really good feedback from this lesson. And this is a video lesson that helps address something that I had to work through quite a bit when I was learning how to paint watercolor. And that is overworking my painting. I talk through eight different tips to help you avoid overworking your painting. You can follow the link below, take a look at it, and I hope it can help you out as well. So I hope that you found this helpful today. Keep working, keep pushing forward, and moving forward as an artist, and I will see you next time.